Uh, thanks for every, everyone for attending. Uh, Carmel's here today to make a public plea in relation to any information in relation to the death of her brother, Tony. Tony McGrath was, uh, we believed, killed at his residence at 93 Maynard Street at Wollongabba uh, on Tuesday the 21st of May. Uh, Tony was found, uh, his body was found under his house at that location uh, two weeks ago today. He was found by a friend um, at about 6pm on the 23rd of May. Um, we're investigating that murder and we've asked Carmel and she's, uh, uh, thank goodness, or luckily for us, she's uh, agreed to attend. Um, so i would just ask for any questions uh, of Carmel, thank you. Um, yes, my, well, my brother and I were the only two living um, children of my mother and father, so we were very, very close. Um, he, we, my mother and father had lived in 93 Lower Maynard Street, and um, after they passed away, Tony lived in that house to the day of his passing. We went to local schools. We went to St Luke's at Buranda. We walked to school every day, and then Tony did his high school at Villanova. Um, Tony left halfway through year 11 to take up a position with Australian Taxation Office and he worked there for 39 years until he retired two years ago. But while he was at the Taxation Office he um, completed his year 12 certificate, the senior certificate it was back then, and then went on to university to, um, to study a Bachelor of Business. Um, also, around the time, it would have been about 18, he joined the Referees Association and he had a long-term association with the referees. Um, he was very much a family man. Um, he was my greatest confidant and friend. Um, he was a, lo a loving brother and a loving friend, very loyal friend. Um, we were brought up with very old-fashioned values. We were brought up to respect other people's uh, space and possessions. But if anyone ever needed any, anything, um, he was always the first there. He used to joke to me that he, um, anyone in the Referees Association that had ever laid a, a slab of concrete or did any renovations or ever moved, he'd moved all of them. And um, the same with us and our family. If anyone had um, something to be moved or uh, he, he um, we we had anything to do with the family, like um, w any weddings or anything like that, or even with my husband's funeral, he was always the first one there to assist us. So, um, very loving family man. Gentlemen. Yes, certainly. Did he have any enemies? Did no. Did he seem like the sort of person who might have any enemies? Well, no, he was a peacemaker. He was so non-confrontational. -confront Sorry, I can't get the words out. He was a you know, very non-confrontational person. And I think that's the one thing that anyone who's known Tony, we can't understand why. Um, he was, as I say, the best, best adjective I can think of is peacemaker. He seemed to keep to himself a fair bit, Carmel. Is that, you know, was there any particular reason why, or he was just a, a shy man? Well, I don't think he did keep to himself, really. I think I did read a report, one of the very few reports I've read, that he was a loner, but I don't think he was. As I said, we had an old-fashioned background, upbringing that we um, we respected other people. Um, but he went to referees three or to, three or to, to, four times a week. You know, he had uh, his funeral were three hundred people there at the funeral. He had many friends through taxation department. I think what he had, he had long-term good friends. Well, he'd refereed since he was 18, so he was 57 when he passed away. He was a life member at the Referees Association. So he started off as a, as a referee, and as the years uh, went on, when he was made a life member in 1992, he um, then wanted to mentor young referees and got onto the admin side of the Referees Association. So he'd been on committees, and he was in, de uh, in development groups with the referees. and. When he retired, he retired in um, 2010, I think it was, uh, and just after that, in January 2011, the floods happened in Brisbane and their Referees Association ground was um, 
impacted. So Tony then did volunteer work, like um, he was there every day to help build up the um, the grounds. He then coordinated in getting bookings for the referees to you know to um, to raise revenue. He was instrumental in the um, canteen. He stocked the canteen. Um, and he was one of those old-fashioned people that you hear about that volunteer with no monetary gain. So um, when we say that he was a loner, I, I don't think he was a loner. He was just a quiet man, a very private man, but he had a lot of acquaintances. What was the last thing you said to him? Do you remember your last conversation? I remember the last thing he said to me. Um, we had had... Um, Tony had been refereeing a game out the north side. I live, at, I live near the bay side. And we had a favourite fish and chip shop. And he said, I'm going to specifically ask to watch this young referee so I can come and have fish and chips with you. And as he drove me back home, the last thing he said to me is, thank you for taking care of me. Because he had stayed with me for the five and a half months of his recovery after the fire. And how did you hear about I found out um, 10 days ago the police um, came to my house and advised me that my brother had, did I know Anthony John McGrath, and that he was deceased. How hard has this been for you, Carmel, knowing that there's someone out there still responsible and they haven't been? Well, it's devastating. Uh, this is my, this was my last relative. This was my, you know, um, there was mum and dad and Tony and I, this is the last person. And that was our family home. And all my brother was doing was driving into his driveway. He was shot in his driveway in underneath the house. It's devastating and, and it's, 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 I'm so unnerved by it. And I just want to know why. And I'm, that's why I've come here today. I'm appealing to anyone in the general public who Tony might have spoken to, who has confided in, to help us find out what's happened. Because we all, we all should be able to feel safe in our own home. Um, there was a fire in the house in October. Uh, again, I um, I didn't have the, my radio or television on that morning and one of my sons called me to say, Mum, there's been a house fire in Wollongabba and it's Uncle Tony. We need to get to the hospital straight away. And, and so I did. I went to the hospital and, um, when, and I had to identify, identify. He'd come in as unknown. And when I first got there, I thought the worst. But when we went into intensive care, they, were, they had the tube down his throat um, working on him. And they told me that um, they had to have to go in and try to save his toes. So um, they did that. They had to amputate three toes on one foot and one on the other. And that night when he, when he came out of surgery, he had no memory of the fire. None. He doesn't remember. He remembers waking up in the hospital room with the missing, missing toes. But he was in hospital in Royal Brisbane for about five weeks. He had to have a skin graft. Um, and then when he came out of hospital, he came to live with me because of my floor plan. Like, he couldn't walk stairs or anything like that. So he came to me for the five and a half months to recuperate. Did he ever indicate to you that he felt that someone had done that to him or that no. he felt someone was out to get him? No, he felt, he felt that he had angels that night because basically, from what we gather, and I'm only, I'm only telling you what Tony told me, my first impression when I got to the hospital that night is that I, my beloved brother, was alive. So, you know, but he thinks what happened is he's got up during the night and walked down the side of the bed. There was an old um, power board or, or some frayed power board. He stepped on that and he was thrown back on the bed unconscious. It happened about two o'clock in the morning, and please, I don't know if I'm spot on, but the neighbours next door had saw a flicker of light, and they'd come in to see if he was home, and they didn't think he was, but he coughed, and they got into him, but he was um, very lucky to survive the scene. But he, he just said, oh, look, it, I've had a second chance of life. So again, he finished recovering from Yes, yeah, he was still undergoing recovery, like he, when I say he was, he would have had ongoing recovery. There was, um, he was still under, under the going back to the burns unit for checkups, and he was under his own doctor at Cooperu. Yeah. So to you, this is just a complete absolute, oh. absolute nightmare. Can't, cannot believe it. Are you scared, Carmen? Um, I'm more unnerved than scared because then this is, 
it's unnerving to think that you're not safe in your own home. I think we all should be unnerved. I really do, you know. Um, it's more unnerving when anyone when anyone passes away. You know, you, you're there with them one minute, you're there with them the next. It was my birthday yesterday. Tony and I were going to meet up last night for a steak. It was the lot we had planned that. That was unnerving too. That's the last time of my, you know, I have children, but that was the last time we were going to, you know, we'd made arrangements to meet. And that's why it's so important I'm appealing to anyone to assist the police. None of us should feel scared. None of us should feel unnerved, you know. Tony was a good and decent man. He worked hard all his life. Carmel, how do you feel knowing that somebody hunted your brother? It wasn't, uh, doesn't appear to be a random killing. This was a targeted strategic attack at the place he was most vulnerable. Well, I'm not sure if he was hunted. I don't know that. But what it does, I, I think, I just want to know why and how dare they. How dare they kill my brother? He had years of life lived. He, he'd gone through the skin grafts and the pain of going through that. He'd learned to walk again. He was driving again. He was back in the referees. He was, a, he was so proud when he was um, voted in as president. How dare someone take that away from him? That's how I feel. But I don't know about what you're saying about Hunter. I, I don't know about that. Again, I'm just appealing for anyone who saw anything or Tony might have said the least little thing, please get in touch with the police so we can get closure. Have you spoken with his friends? Yes. I've spoken to um, a lot of his friends and, and also I caught up to, with some of them at the funeral. Yeah. And have they told you everyone? Everyone, everyone says the same, same thing. Why Tony? Why Tony? Well, all through his life he was a nurturer and a mentor. So, you know, um, he wasn't someone that was argumentative. Um, and that came through with, all, with, with anyone in the referees or with the um, uh, in, in taxation department or even in the family. He was just, um, you know, um, a peaceful man, a peacemaker. He was my confidant, so if I called him and said, oh, look, this is happening here, and he'd say, well, you know, he'd say, oh, just calm down, you know. You know, think of it this way, and, yeah, that's what I mean with the peacemaker. He wasn't aggressive. I've never known him to be aggressive. Detectives, I don't know what, what you make of this. You know, how does this murder stand out by contrast to some others? Uh, it's uh, certainly baffling at this stage. Um, as Carmel said, um, Tony certainly didn't have any enemies, and we've been... Uh, investigating this intensely for two weeks and certainly we haven't uh, uh, uncovered any enemies as such. He was a clean living man, uh, honest, hard working, uh, not a recluse as was first reported, as Carmel's alluded to. So uh, it's very uh, frustrating from us. Uh, Is there a possibility here that this might have been a mistaken attack? Anything's possible at this stage, yes. Um, one detective was quoted as saying that he didn't think it was a random attack. Um, is there anything to suggest that you know this was someone? I mean, is there is there something specific that suggests that it was someone that he knows? Uh, from witnesses, it could well be that uh, because of a brief argument that neighbours or witnesses have heard, that uh, we're hopeful it's not mistaken identity, and we're certainly hopeful uh, that it's not uh, a, a random thing. So if 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 you if there was an argument and a confrontation, then you would assume, I would think, that um, they were known to each other. So. Can you tell us about that argument? Was it on the night of the 21st? That's right, yes. And uh, there was no words heard. It was just the witnesses that had heard raised voices. So. Again, that may or may not have occurred on that night. People perceived different things were looking at all but that. Between two men or between... Um, were they able to indicate um, how many people? No. They weren't. It seemed to be male voices, but again, that's not certain from the witnesses. So it's only reported after this body was found? Big girls. Were these the, the reports of an argument? Was that reported after this body yeah. was found? Yes, yes. What about his work at the taxation office? Um, have you looked into that? Yes, we have. We're looking at all angles of Tony's life. Yeah. So, was there any of his um, cases that he was put on? Was he assigned to you know, audit um, particular people and stay on that case? Probably Carmel. I was only talking about this earlier, so you probably best to answer that. Tony did a lot of work in, in project work. Um, so um, 
Tony retired. It was his. It was a voluntary retirement. He decided to retire it, um, when he was 55. So, um, but previous to that, he'd been working on project work with the GS, working on the GST and superannuation. So, um, and he was also doing training. So, um, and that was two and a half years ago. Uh, it has been extensive, the search, yeah. We uh, uh, call on the SES, who are wonderful. They searched all that area of Norman Creek. If you know it, it's heavily uh, mangroved mm. uh, at the bottom of uh, Tony Street, and he lives a short distance from there. So uh, clearly, if anyone had gone in there in, on foot, which is a possibility too, um, from Dashen Street or nearby mm. streets, um, we had divers also search the creek there thoroughly. And interestingly enough, since since the floods, the, the creek was quite clean, so they're 95% sure that uh, that's been searched thoroughly. And at this stage, the firearm hasn't been located. How large is this investigation to get a major instance room set up and the detectives? Yeah, we do. We have a major incident room set up at Dutton Park Police Station. Um, we've got the assistance of the homicide squad. Uh, the numbers in, of investigators and police involved vary from day to day with resourcing, but we're putting as many resources to it as we need. So at this stage you wouldn't rule out that there is a possibility that it was a case of mistaken identity? Can't rule out anything at this stage, unfortunately. Would you describe it? Is it the detective stage, a mystery, you've got no way? Yes, yes. It's not a particularly nice question to ask, but what style of killing was it? Was it cold and calculated? Was it a brutal slaying? Yeah. One shot, what sort of, uh, what sort of killing was it? Uh, it? It was one gunshot wound to the head. Um, all we know is it was brisk. Um, Execution style? Well, whether it was out or not, or just a passionate thing, we don't know. Do you know what sort of gun it was? Uh, we believe it was a, a 22 calibre, uh, low calibre uh, uh, weapon, possibly a pistol or a, or a sawn off weapon, but again, that's open to debate. That's right, yes. Mm. Yeah. We believe it occurred at nine o'clock on the Tuesday night mm. and on the Thursday night a friend of Tony's from the uh, Referees Association went to look for Tony and he found him there about six o'clock on the Thursday night. Mm. You must have had much help from the public. I mean, you know, many calls to try and stop it. Really, but it's frustrating that you haven't sort of received much information. We've had some calls to crime stoppers, but yes, it is frustrating. I certainly mm. would like more information. Is it a case that you're out of leads now? or are you still pursuing some lines of inquiry? Are you literally desperate at this stage? Uh, look, I wouldn't say where there's lots of lines of inquiry, we're still running. Um, uh, but we would like uh, further information um, with new leads, of, of, uh, clearly. Uh, sorry, other than the argument on the night, um, was there anything else unusual um, reported by neighbours or any other sightings of any people or cars that have been reported? No, no. Um, personally, I don't think it's a random attack. That's my feeling. But certainly, it's concerning to every member of the public that someone can do this and they're mm. walking around. I mean, it's clearly worrying to everyone, including mm. ourselves, you know. Mm. Yes, that could be right. And, and we haven't exhausted all the inquiries. There's still lots and lots of work to be done um, mm -hmm. with our methodologies and whatnot. Not, uh, there's a hell of a lot of work to be done. But at this stage, we just don't know what direction to look in. Well, I think that's why I'm here today, to appeal to the general public if they know anything. Sometimes it might be so insignificant, but it might help the police. So we're asking anyone who's had any um, contact with Tony within those last, the last four weeks of his life, um, to come forward and help us. Just help us find out what happened or who did it. Please, please, please help us. Lee, what's your role in the investigation? Can I reach out to you too? Oh, uh, basically I'm the, um, the family liaison officer and also just assisting with the investigation itself. Um, yeah, that's the basis of my role. Probably covered it all. 
Yeah. Pretty well, yeah. 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 I'm sure there will be. Um, we're quite fortunate where it's happened is there's extensive CCTV uh, in that Deshan and semi-industrial area and the residential area around there. We're very fortunate in that regard. We just really need that silver bullet of someone with a bit more CCTV mm. that's clearer. A lot of it is, isn't clear, some is clear. Um, so that's going to be a great uh, source for us, but obviously that takes a lot of time to uh, review and analyse. Um, look, we're still examining that. We're still re the results are pending on a lot of that right. stuff. So, yeah. You may have mentioned this earlier, but how many officers have you got in place? Um, uh, it varies. It varies from times. And when we had searches, you know, we'd have up to 50 police. Uh, normally, in the um, major incident room, or the investigation centre, we'd have uh, 20 to 30. 20 to 30, yeah. Um, if you don't mind my ask about this, um, the funeral, how, how do people, you know, respond, what, um, you know, to this, you know, how are they talking to you about this, you know, shock death? Well, I think everyone was shocked. Um, that's what, that was the, over, uh, the overriding um, uh, comments at the funeral. Everyone was shocked and couldn't believe it, and couldn't believe it happened to Tony. It was quite a large funeral. Uh, it was a requiem mass, because we wanted, um, uh, you know, he'd been, he'd been, when we found him, he'd been dead for two days, so I wanted him to have the Catholic ceremony. Um, but everyone, everyone came up and said to me, we can't believe this has happened. You said this was your last connection to your original family. You must be feeling incredibly lonely at this stage. Well, um, I, I am. I am. I, um, my mum and dad and Tony and I were a unit. Um, my mother used to buy casket tickets in the, you know, in the olden days when we had caskets and the syndicate was Cage, Carmel, Anthony, George and Eunice. Now there's only me left. When did you last see the uh, story about the fish and chips? Yeah. What was that? It would have been, um, oh, I can't think, it was, it would have been probably 10 days before Tony passed away, but we um, were having a, one of my granddaughters was having a little birthday party and he, I text him, he, we would have seen him then, you know what I mean? So it would have been about 10 days before. We just put your referee side, where, what sort of, where did he referee and what sort of games, age group, that sort of thing? Well, he refereed quite a few years ago. Um, so he wasn't current? No, he, he was in the admin side. He was the president of the Referees Association. He was, he was working towards building up the ranks and mentoring young referees and bringing people through the ranks. That's where, what he was doing. And also in the admin work of building up the, um, the fields and getting the canteen um, to be viable and also um, booking out the fields, like, you know, to get more revenue for the referees. So he was an all-in admin. Uh, admin. Mm. And when did he stop refereeing? I can't remember. I'm so sorry.